Hi, welcome everyone. We'll get started in just a few minutes. Okay, we're at 1 p.m. Eastern. Um, Lauren, do you wanna go ahead and get started? Sure. Um, welcome everyone. It's great to have you all with us today and we're delighted to welcome Vincenzo Corelli, who is our speaker today. And he is going to be talking about integrating climate change into marine protected area management plans. Obviously, climate change is one of the huge challenges that marine protected areas face as do other parts of the ocean. And so this is a great uh, window into how MPA programs are looking at climate change and the degree to which they are integrating uh, climate into their management plans. I'd also like to thank and welcome Haleen Anderson and Deb Croft, who are going to be doing ASL translating today. Thank you and welcome. Um, I'm just gonna give you a quick outline of how we run these webinars if you haven't joined us before, and then I will introduce Vinny and let him take it away. Um, First, my name is Lauren Wenzel. I'm the director of the National Marine Protected Area Center at NOAA, and I will be your facilitator today. Um, typically, we have uh, our presenter, and then we will open the floor for questions and comments. We do have an opportunity for you to add questions and comments in the webinar interface under the question box. You don't need to wait till the end to do that. So as questions occur to you, please feel free to put those in and we will go through those after the presentation. Uh, so now it's my pleasure to introduce Vinny. Uh, Vinny was only recently discovered on the shores of San Diego after being cast out by a pod of humpback whales. And his first contact with humans came from a team of marine biologists and ecologists who had come to take samples. And so because he equated being human with marine environment and marine science, he decided to pursue a marine science degree. Um, but because he was a marine creature, he really didn't understand inland geography and ended up in Montreal. Uh, but after he completed his undergraduate degree, he enrolled in the Institut National de la Recherche Scientifique, a research-based university that specializes in developing practical and implementable solutions to issues of environmental sustainability. And now with a collaboration uh, through Dalhousie University, he has finally returned to the shores of the ocean. Um, he has been uh, delving deep into the world of marine protected areas and the actions that they are taking to adapt to the impacts of climate change and also developing an ocean-based learning curriculum for youths. And these days you are most likely to find Vinny sitting at his desk, working on his thesis, a few hundred feet from open water with a tempting line to the Atlantic Ocean. So welcome, Vinny. Well, thank you, uh, Lauren, for the introduction and good afternoon for everyone that's here on the call. Uh, before I begin, I would like to take a moment to pay homage to the land uh, upon which I'm speaking to you from. Although originally from Jojagwe, the unceded traditional territory of the Ganehaka, uh, today, I'm speaking to you from Chibuktuk, also known as Halifax, which is located in Mi'kma'ki, the ancestral and traditional lands of the Mi'kmaq people. And the peace and friendship treaties were signed in this territory as of 1726. I recognize that we are all treaty people and would like to thank the Mi'kmaq for their stewardships of these lands, past, present, and future, and promise that while I'm here as an uninvited guest within their lands, I will tread lightly and show my respect to the land and to even the smallest of our kin within. So again, I'd like to thank everybody that's taking their time to come listen to me talk today. Uh, I'm overwhelmed by the response and the amount of people 
uh, that registered and uh, it definitely makes me uh, feel positive and good that a grad student like myself, a lot of the times you think that no one cares about the research that you're doing and you guys are showing me the opposite. So thank you for that. Uh, for today, my talk will be looking at marine protected areas, also known as MPAs, and how they're incorporating climate change within their management plans. Uh, so while many of the rooms I've given this talk to, I usually open up with a deep dive into MPAs and their benefits. Uh, being that this is a webinar put on by Octo and NOAA, I feel that most likely I'll be preaching to the crier and that most members here are aware of the importance that MPAs play in the role of uh, attaining the international biodiversity requirements and protection. Um, with all these accrued benefits that we receive from MPAs, the impacts of climate change have started to threaten and undermine their ability to achieve a lot of their biodiversity targets or goals that they set forth, uh, be it that climate change and its impacts are rewriting and redrawing much of the boundaries and habitat for the marine life that they are striving to protect. Uh, as it stands now, uh, we are dealing with rising sea surface temperature, increasing acidification, and of course, species on the move, uh, some reports being as much as 19 kilometers per year, they will be moving. And so because of that, there is a big push to be able to see how can these marine protected areas be able to incorporate climate change within their management plans to be able to adapt and if need be mitigate these negative consequences that they're facing. So for this presentation, uh, first we'll start off with a little bit of background on the project, and then we'll move into the nuts and bolts. Uh, finally, we'll take a look at the meat and potatoes or fish and chips, if you would, which will be the results. And uh, time permitting, we'll take a look at the major takeaways and as well as the future steps. So, like most stories, I feel it's best to start at the beginning. And for me, the beginning and the start of these research projects brings us to a tiny subtropical island located uh, midway, smack dab in the middle of the Atlantic, halfway between South America and Africa, and whose name is Ascension Island. So Ascension Island's origin story is about as wild as you can get, uh, involving terraforming, Napoleon, Darwin himself, and I can only assume a lot of rum. But due to time constraints, we're going to have to leave those stories for another day. Uh, because for us, we arrive on scene much later in life, in time to witness uh, in 2019, this small island with its 800 inhabitants allocate all their territorial waters into a marine protected areas. And uh, as such, become one of the largest MPAs in the world. The management team that is uh, overseeing this marine protected area is very forward thinking and they reached out to our lab with the goal in mind of developing a management plan that would be valid for the next 100 years. Uh, being cognizant and aware of the impacts of climate change, they recognize that they have to be proactive and develop a management plan that incorporates actions that are able to adapt or mitigate to these negative effects. Uh, for a quick look and see what a marine protected area looks like from the sky, this is a still shot uh, from a time lapse on the Global Fishing Watch database. It's a database that tracks the uh, effort of fishing vessels around the world by tracking their uh, automated identification system, this satellite ping that they have. All the bright pixels that you see, or all the pixels that you see that are in green are fishing fleets and fishing effort in hours over the last year. So although this is somewhat of a boring map, you can see that tiny dot in the middle is Ascension Island and all the dark ocean water around free of the fishing vessels is the marine protected area. So hard and uh, visual proof of the effectiveness of MPAs at at least giving marine life breathing room while they have a chance to thrive. So Ascension is an important nesting site for green turtles that 
happened to uh, eat and forage off the coast of Brazil and then do the 6,000 kilometer trip every year from feeding off of Brazil to nest and lay eggs on the shores of Ascension. On top of having uh, those important nesting sites, there's also multiple seamounts that are within their protected areas that have a high level of endemic species. And as such, the management plan for Ascension Island is very much around uh, growth and adapt adaptability and understanding that as things change and the conditions change, they must be prepared to tackle them head on. So <clears throat> as they reached out to us and want to see what are their options and what actions existed, we first started by mining the literature. And from the literature, you have starting in 2019 uh, through Tintensor now, a big push to highlight the need and the importance of integrating climate change adaptivity, uh, adaptation into biodiversity conservation, uh, followed up by Wilson et al. in 2020, that was showing that the, the need and lack thereof of incorporating climate change within MPAs and MPA structures puts us at a, at a step back and a possible weakness point in confronting the upcoming change. And finally, uh, there is uh, from Oregon et al. in 2021, was a global assessment done on climate change adaptation within protected areas and management plans. Now, the Oregon et al. research paper was able to show that uh, there is a small uptake in terms of actual adaptation actions within marine protected area management plans. They were able to score uh, the management plans on a climate robustness index that they developed themselves. They originally started by looking at uh, 15,000 MPAs, basically all the MPAs that are on the world database of protected areas. They narrowed that down to pull out all the uh, marine protected areas that had accessible management plans, as well as those that were in English or had an English translation available to it. And using that database that was then uh, down to 647 management plans, they scored the management plans to see their climate robustness under their index and scored them at a score of zero to 28 and ended up with 223 management plans, uh, uh, all scoring between one and the highest score that we had, or they had, excuse me, was 23. So building off of their database, and using those 223 management plans is where I came in to the project and began looking through and actually analyzing all three, uh, all 223 management plans. So what we did was do a keyword search uh, using climate, climate change, resiliency, adaptation, mitigation, every combination therein. These management plans themselves uh, scan the uh, globe in its entirety. As you can see from the map that is up on screen, there is a heavier load of the MPAs that are represented within North America uh, due to the structure of their management plans that uh, accentuated climate change. So in using this database and then going through all these 223 management plans and pulling out any instance of climate, climate change, resilience, and adaptation. Goal was to pull out any action that we could find that was connected within that. So the first step after pulling out every instance of those words was then defining what an action was. So originally we built off of the concept of SMART, which is a common business acronym that is used for goal setting, uh, which is specific, measurable, attainable, um, uh, well, I forgot what the R was, uh, and time management. So what we did was modify that to change it from a goal setting paradigm into one of defining an action. So we built it on uh, around SMET, which is specific, measurable, existent, task oriented, and time bound. So by specific, we meant is the action itself clearly defined or identified? Measurable is self-explanatory. Are there clear benchmarks that we can track and measure over time? 
existing is the activity already occurring so concurrently happening even though the management plan has already been printed and finally is it uh, task oriented and time bound so is there a specific piece of work that has to be completed uh, for this action to be achieved and is there a deadline or at least a time frame within it has to happen so for us we decided that uh, any action so as to cast as wide as net as possible would be anything that met at least two of the requirements uh, within SMET. And as such, the results that we ended up pulling out um, with that kind of guideline was ultimately 213 actions across the 223 management plans. Uh, after having pulled out the actions, we were able to see that they organically slotted into four uh, primary categories. That's monitoring, research, management, and outreach. For monitoring, we are looking at any action or activity that is uh, tracking either abiotic or biotic conditions and seeing their transition over time. Research was a lot of actions that were looking at uh, establishing existing baselines, uh, establishing a lot of the biodiversity that, that existed within the parks, as uh, as as well as the points of interest or points uh, that were most at risk. Uh, finally, then we not finally, but second to last, we get to management. Uh, management is actually the category that we were uh, the most interested in, and that is dealing with uh, both adaptive measures, so on the ground physical actions, as well as bureaucratic or administrative actions that deal with as such the paperwork or behind the scenes that goes into a management of a protected area. Um, the last was outreach and outreach was uh, communicating climate change, climate change effects or impacts on the parks with external partners or with the visitors that were coming to the park. Our results and what we found were broken down uh, as follows. So, the largest section was monitoring research. They were a little over 75% of all the actions that we found. Uh, following that, we had management that had 37 actions, which was a little over 17%, and outreach, which was the smallest category that had 13 actions or 6%. So examples, so that you guys can get uh, uh, an idea of what, what this means. Within modeling, uh, they looked at a lot of uh, let's say in the case of uh, um, the Matchlet Pass Aquatic Preserve, they were dealing with the Massachusetts Institute of Technology to develop climate change and sea level rise model. Uh, we saw a lot of uh, SLAM models being uh, used and in, incorporated within uh, the protected areas. For research itself, a lot of the actions that uh, came through were again trying to identify areas. Uh, that will be of importance uh, or possibly changing within the coming time. Uh, for management, it uh, broke down into the two categories that I mentioned before, adaptive measures and administrative measures. Adaptive measure would be an example of using a rolling easement tied to a sea level uh, rise that they're doing in Cap Romana. And for administration, that could be just developing the protocols for a vertical control network along long-term monitoring sites. So as I said before, management is definitely the category that we want to dive the most into because we, our expectation was that is the category that would have the most transferable and uh, applicable uh, actions that we could then broadcast across multiple MPAs to be able to uh, to be able to translate this knowledge and to put into action and help the MPAs better protect themselves. Within the management category, we found obviously ultimately out of 230 total actions, only 10 were the adaptive measures that we were so hoping to be able to find uh, a large um, database or or amount of uh, the actions themselves were very site specific and not always easily transferable. Uh, the actions involved uh, allocating budgets or funds to be able to 
purchase bordering lands to the protected areas to be able to ensure that in the case of potential sea level rise, that there was uh, land for the, the actual marine life and coastal life to be able to retreat as the sea level rise grew. These, uh, these actions uh, that we found were ultimately um, across only 13 management plans. They covered 17 MPAs as total because uh, there were a few MPAs that shared and combined and used the same management plan uh, across their parks. So the total 37 actions itself coming from 17 MPAs and the 10 actions themselves, which we were hoping to be able to build off of and find considerably more. This brings us to a place where ultimately for us, we were looking and limiting our scope and looking only at biodiversity related actions. That meant that any action, although maybe dealing with mitigation or adaptation of climate change, if it wasn't directly involved in the primary uh, role of an MPA, which uh, we believe is to conserve biodiversity within its parks borders. Um, we made sure that we only pulled those actions related to the biodiversity. There was, especially across, across a lot of the U.S. management plans, uh, thanks to the National Park Service Climate Adaptation Strategy, a nationally mandated um, guideline that was uh, put out to all the park services areas. It had a lot of component of actions that were then found within all the individual management plans in a lot of these U.S. coastal MPAs, but the large component of the actions themselves dealt with infrastructure, so dealing with uh, being able to protect or shore up infrastructure against extreme events, rising sea level, and a lot of the actions also centered around the visitor experience. So looking at whether they would need to relocate a parking lot or do temporary closures for pass or accessibilities to some of the beaches uh, to compensate for the changing in sea level rise or as i said the increase in extreme weather events uh, lastly uh, some of the other actions that were included within this npa the national adaptation climate change strategy was in how to mitigate each individual park's carbon footprint so looking at what technological advances they could do or what practices they can put into place so that they were not contributing as much in terms of a carbon footprint. Again, those actions, although uh, beneficial and having worth, weren't directly related to biodiversity and as such were not included within our actual analysis. The, the end result is that we have a lot of actions that fall into monitoring and research, but light on actual actionable items. And there's a subtlety to that because within monitoring, how it's broken down is in a lot of the management plans, it would be one or two sentences that would be, you are to monitor pH, surface sea temperature, sea level rise, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Each one of those items became an action list. So it, artificially uh, increase the monitoring action category. So within a lot of these management plans, even though it was just one or two lines that would be pulled from that would be about four or five, sometimes six separate actions within the monitoring. If you bring that back down and uh, reconcentrate the monitoring, it then becomes research that is the largest category and it is understandable. In these types of scenarios, it is important for the marine protected areas to be able to understand what they have and what is at risk before being able to move ahead and discovering or figuring out a way to be able to, to actually adapt and, and put actions in place. Um, for us, as it stands right now, our future steps, which we've started to uh, put into place, is reaching out to the individual individual MPAs, especially those that rated the highest within the categories, to be able to see what actions exist that aren't being captured in the management plan, but still are being put into place on the ground in person. Uh, there's 
a high probability that a lot of these operational actions, even though they aren't reflected in the management plans, are still recognized by managers on the ground and as such put into place. So as we keep growing our database, the idea is that as we continue these connections with these managers of multiple MPAs, uh, we're able to remove them from the individual silos that they are in and be able to uh, bring the actions from one MPA to the other so that it is a communal database upon which they're able to uh, dive into and grow from there. Um, ultimately, for our goals within this is to create an open accessible database that we've done through a DOI, breaking down the actions that we've found into their components and linking them to specific, specific effects of climate change. And so doing, that's gonna give the ability for MPA managers to come to our database and be able to pull from these individual items that are linked to specific effects of climate change and ultimately build themselves a customizable database uh, and management plan that is specific to their climate vulnerabilities. As we move forward, uh, we understand that ultimately a lot of the managers that are within these MPAs, the desire and willingness to be able to, to implicate or uh, implement a lot of these actions is there, but there are constraints, be it budgetary or through administrative, that prevent them from being able to uh, move forward. So our goal is, as we disseminate more and more of the actions and recruit more and more MPA managers uh, and are able to build and develop our database by including uh, multiple management plans from a variety of languages, since right now we've concentrated primarily on English, um, then the database itself will be able to grow and as such be able to help not just Ascension Island, but uh, all the other MPAs that are right now faced and confronting with dealing with climate change. In a lot of these cases, when you're designing a new MPA, you can have a dynamic border or be able to have a, maybe a, uh, a moving MPA that follows the individual species. But there is a large grouping of MPAs that exist that were already established that have set boundaries uh, that for them, the ability to move with the species is not an option. So they are reliant on uh, these actions to be able to adapt and mitigate and be able to attain their goals of still being able to meet their biodiversity targets. Um, so on my end, uh, I'd like to thank you guys for your time and paying attention. I'd like to give a special thank out to Karen Hunter from the GFO, who has been an absolute angel in holding my hand and going through a lot of the, the writing and this information. I'd like to thank Sarah and the Octo Listserv for this opportunity to be able to present, uh, as well as Noah. And finally, I'd like to thank Aline and Deb for being able to do the ASL while I give my talk. On the last slide, we can see uh, we have uh, my contact info. If there's anybody that has any questions or has any uh, comments or would like to follow up, as well as the address for the database that we established with all the actions that I pulled uh, off of the management plans across um, the 223. So I believe if we have any questions, um, the floor is open. All right, thank you so much, Vinny. That was really interesting. And I know we already have some, some great questions here. Uh, so I'm just gonna start with some of the questions that have come in and I invite others on the webinar to please go ahead and send in your questions and comments. So you had mentioned that most of the work today has been focused on management plans that are in English. Uh, do you have any comments or insights about um, what impact this might have of not having other languages represented from other countries? Uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's a lack then of other potential actions that exist. So we're not able to mine uh, everything and we're limited to that sphere of just English or management plans that had an English translation that were readily available. Um, there was also, uh, a problem being able to find a lot of the uh, marine protected areas don't have any management plans that are accessible that we can even access or download. So as we move forward, broadening the, the breadth of languages that we can dig into will just mean a higher chance of finding more actions that are maybe site specific to those MPAs um, and then be able to, of course, translate those actions and then spread them widely so that 
the MTAs that we're currently dealing with will be able to have access to. Great. Um, I had a question, you know, given that MPAs often only update their management plans every 10 years or so, and obviously climate is moving at such a fast pace, um, do you have any thoughts about trying to capture actions that may be occurring outside the management plan process, realizing that that can be a challenge to track down that kind of information? Yeah, so that's the phase two of the project, and uh, it involves a lot of cold calling to the MPA sites themselves to try to get somebody on the phone or any manager to be able to then develop a relationship and find out, like I said, what are the operational measures that they might be implementing that are not covered in the management plan. And the assumption is that there are probably quite a few. Uh, the downside to not having an action uh, established within a management plan is there is less follow-up and uh, how can I say this, less onus on having to actually complete the action if it's not solidified within the management plan. But the truth is on the ground operations, uh, a lot of the reactions that they have to do to some of the negative effects of climate change uh, won't be captured in the management plan and will be most likely more in their standard operating procedures. And so for us to be able to get access to that is now the next step after we've dived through all the management plans is then reach out and do the one-on-one -on -one talking and find out through individual interviews uh, what other actions are they using and incorporate those actions into our database. Even though they're not within the management plans, ultimately we want to pass this information out to the marine protected areas that exist so that they have access and, and can try to take these actions and uh, put them into place in their parks. Great, thank you. And, and I'll just note that Sarah Hutto has mentioned another resource that may be uh, useful, and I can put it in the chat, um, that is the um, Climate Adaptation uh, website has an MPA toolkit from, uh, from EcoAdapt. So we'll, that's kkex.org, and I, I'll put that in the chat. Um, there was a question, were you shocked to find so few actions related to climate change, given the large sample size that you had taken? Um, absolutely. I mean, I, I, originally, which is never good when you go into science to, to go in with preconceived notions of what you're going to find. Um, I mean, science has a, uh, an ability to uh, write any hubris that you have. Uh, so we expected to, uh, especially in the higher ranked management plans that have been scored by Oregon et al. with their climate robustness index, uh, we were expecting to be able to find more transferable actions and definitely more operational or adaptive measures. Uh, we thought it would end up falling along the lines of a list of actions that were adaptive and a list of actions that were uh, mitigative. Uh, when we started going through and seeing the paucity of examples, um, it definitely was uh, definitely was a wake up. Uh, but again, understandably, knowing that for, as you mentioned, like in our case, a lot of these uh, uh, mansion plans date from 2016 and on. So there are always, as you say, updated sometimes five to 10 years. So it's possible that as the marine protected areas and their management teams uh, catch up and are confronted more and more with climate change, then the subsequent iterations of their management plans will start including more actions. But at least it gave us, as of now, a baseline to be like, okay, this is what we have. And even though it is not a lot, it is still something. And something is always better than nothing. Uh, another side point is a lot of these management plans uh, put as their um, management paradigm to be adaptive ecosystem management. So as a base and starting point, that is the best management paradigm to be able to deal with these fluctuations that we're going to encounter because of climate change so although i didn't find a lot of actions i was like at least at the bare minimum their management paradigm is set up the best possible way to be able to deal and confront with you know dynamic and changing situations and can you say a little bit about what you would say are the sort of major climate change related actions that you think are most important to be included in management plans based on your review um, I, I, I do concede, although I was 
I should say disappointed because I mean, we should be leaving emotions out of this. Uh, the amount of, of uh, monitoring actions in retrospect is a, is a must. You know, ultimately we can't protect what we don't know that is changing or that we're losing or that is moving. So at bare minimum base, we need to have monitoring actions. I appreciated a few of the management plans because they were hyper-specific when they would talk about what their monitoring actions would be. So having that within your management plan of being like, hey, we are looking to you know, make sure this specific pH level is there and we will be sampling at this time and this time within this time frame. Uh, that showed an active participation by the management team to be at least at the forefront of being able to identify and understand what was happening within the parts. Uh, other than that, um, I mean, yeah, ultimately I would love to see a lot more fiscal concrete adaptation measures just because a lot of these, because they're site specific, we need as many of the different sites doing them as much as possible so that, that we can take that feedback and then relay it back to the other marine protected areas. And there's a broader chance that even though it's site specific, there will be an, a, uh, another MPA that has a similar you know, abiotic conditions that could maybe a modified version of that action, but be able to grab that action. So does that look like, you know, allowing resedimentation to counter uh, uh, sea level rise? Does that look at, you know, building, you know, rolling easements or building barrier walls? Um, that's to be determined as we move forward, but ultimately those are the actions that are easier for people to be able to visualize, understand, and then the public as a whole is able to say like, hey, yeah, there's, you know, there's seawalls that need to be built now to be able to maintain this area that we have. And uh, that, you know, visual reckoning of the changes that are occurring uh, can be very beneficial in helping the public then to understand, you know, what's at risk. Agreed. Um, on the topic of other languages and assessing other MPA plans, we have a comment that uh, you work with uh, the World Conservation Monitoring Center and the regional seas who have established relationships and that may help you reach out to more uh, individual MPAs. Yes, by all means. I see that bring it on gesture. Oh yeah, I was like the more contacts, you know, the, the, the better it is. Uh, a lot of these a lot of these management plans, uh, what they ended up doing is in their management plans, they would have multiple options of, of what different management plans they were debating and deciding to be able to take before their final decision, which ultimately meant that, you know, the 223 management plans that I went through with the fine tooth and comb, you know, technically was probably closer to about 400 because there was, you know, multiple iterations of, of different management plans itself. And uh, that, 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 database and that growth of having all these different options is one that I realized in the long run just benefits me to be able to find these at sometimes what feels like needle in the haystacks uh, when it comes to the adaptive measures. So the more contact, uh, the more uh, outreach that I can do with different and a variety of MPAs or organizations, the better my research will be and better the database will be. And you mentioned that you were focusing on the biodiversity actions. Um, but you had also mentioned some of them related to infrastructure and visitor use. Did you uh, did you capture those visitor use and infrastructure type uh, recommendations as well in your database? Not in the database. We want to concentrate and maintain it just to be solely for biodiversity conservation measures or helping in biodiversity uh, measures. Because ultimately, we, we view the the true goal or reason of being of having an MPA is to be able to help conserve biodiversity and protect marine life within their borders. Um, so because of that, even though we do acknowledge and understand that, uh, you know, tourism, the benefits of income of having, you know, visitor experiences and whatnot has a lot of spillover benefits and effects for the MPAs within the database. We want to make sure that it was streamlined. It was like, hey, these are the actions you can take to help you know, the, the biodiversity targets that you have outlined or the goals that you've outlined, um, which also you know, leads to another conversation a little bit outside of the scope of my research on, on dealing with um, how you deal with not being able to achieve these biodiversity targets. 
and that there might not be any actions that can be taken to be able to help some particular MPAs. Um, and dealing with, you know, how do you deal with failure and how do you deal with uh, recognizing that some of the goals that you've set out are just not realistic. Yeah, related to that, Vinny, there's a question here about enabling conditions, which gets at um, kind of the, the ability to be successful in some of these actions. And uh, there was a question about whether you are or plan to look at some of these enabling conditions, like flexibility and governance structure, um, as part of your analysis. We didn't include that in. It would have broadened the scope considerably and brought us into uh, some territories that were just outside of, you know, by realms of of uh, knowledge or expertise. Uh, but is definitely something that we encountered and in conversations with other people, um, it was brought up uh, the, especially because, you know, when we made that decision not to include any of the infrastructure actions or the visitor experience actions, uh, some of the pushback was exactly that, that a, a lot of these places that have a high, you know, visitor presence or high public interaction, you know, their ability to be able to uh, weaponize that outreach and then have you know stronger outcomes from it uh, cannot be understated whereas uh, some of the other MPAs that just have you know no infrastructure set up no visitor experiences that are just paper parks ultimately you know do they have the tools the budget the funding abilities to be able to you know implement a lot of these infrastructure or technical I should say not infrastructure but like technical solutions or technical actions uh, will be slightly limited. So not in my scope, but encourage anybody who's on the call that wants to dive into that very worthwhile field. Yeah, thank you. And I will just mention that uh, earlier this year, we did have a presentation on the MPA guide, which I know many of you are familiar with and does discuss enabling conditions as part of the component of the MPA guide. So. I uh, encourage you all to go back and uh, look at the archives if you missed that talk. Uh, there's a lot of great content there as well. Um, I do have a question uh, from France. Do you have any examples of dynamic management? This is a, a topic that we hear a lot about uh, with climate change, uh, changing the conditions in the ocean and the idea that we need to be more flexible and adaptive. Um, just wanting to here if you have examples of MPAs who have implemented dynamic management. So uh, although they didn't use the term dynamic management, they used, uh, like I said, ecosystem adaptive management paradigm, which is a iterative process where they uh, examine, see something that's occurring, see the problem that's connected with it, attempt a potential solution, then reevaluate how that went, and then go back, start over again, change, you know, if need be, their reactions or actions accordingly, and then keep that iterative process until, you know, the situation or problem itself is resolved. Uh, a lot of the uh, U.S. coastal uh, marine protected areas, especially uh, those that were falling along the NPS uh, climate adaptation strategy guideline, uh, they had made very clear that uh, their management paradigm would be one of an ecosystem adaptive structure so that they can not just be looking at individual species or individual events, but taking a look at the ecosystem as a whole and then seeing, hey, our management actions, how are they impacting the ecosystem as a whole? Is it making it better? Is it making it worse? Is it dealing with the problem that we identified? And then reiterate it, change and move forward. So seeing that uh, in a lot of the management plans like i said before was definitely a, a point for me that i was like hey they're starting off with the best base to be able to tackle these problems so uh again a lot of these uh, situations are uh, scenarios i should say uh, were out of uh, the marine protected areas along the coastal areas of the united states so you mentioned Vinny, the um you know, an example of habitat retreat is one example of an adaptation action. And there's a question of whether you saw trends in certain types of MPAs where you would see certain types of actions coming up in the management plans, like in the tropics versus the northern latitudes or coastal versus open ocean. Uh, can you make any observations about that based on what you looked at? 
Um, so the, the, the sad news to that, to that question or the quick answer to that, uh, we didn't have any actions that came from any blue water or open seas MPAs. So all our actions that we were able to pull out were all from coastal MPAs. Uh, again, because we're limited and we were only looking at English language uh, MPAs or ones that translations, there is possible that there are actions that exist from blue water MPAs that just have not been captured within this database. Um, but uh, to answer the other part of your question, if there was trends that were noticed, uh, in all honesty, no, there just weren't enough actions across the management plans to be able to pinpoint trends. So the management plan uh, that had the largest amount of actions uh, was Prime Hook National Wildlife Refuge, and it had four. So when you're dealing with that kind of uh, sample set, uh, it's hard to pull out any trends that may be seen because, you know, a lot of them were getting, you know, one action, maybe two, uh, and many just not. I'm sorry, which, which wildlife refuge was that you mentioned? Uh, Prime Hook National Wildlife Refuge. So they, uh, they're a gold star or gold standard. So is the greater uh, Farallones, I'm probably mispronouncing that. Both are, are, I would say, in terms of, you know, being at the forefront in uh, incorporating actions into their management plan, uh, they were the two, uh, our, our two strongest MPAs that we noticed. And again, you know, we're talking four actions out of a management plan. So, um, you know, to be kept in consideration. Yeah, and I will just note, um, Greater Fairlands, just because I am familiar with it, does include open ocean. So they, they may have um, expanded some of the analysis that they've done to more of the open ocean. I know that they have done a vulnerability assessment that includes the whole sanctuary. So maybe yeah. there's a, we're starting to move in that direction. Yeah, that, that, uh, that would be the hope, yeah. But then again, you know, there has to be, I mean, it has to be stated. Open ocean MPAs, obviously, clearly, in terms of, you know, like concrete operational measures are more limited. You know, the, the coastal MPAs, uh, because you're coastal, uh, you have more options, shall we say, of, of being able to enact something versus a blue water open ocean MPA. You know, there's, there's no seawall you can put up. There's no habitat retreat. There's no, you know, shoring up of, of the sediment base. So. Um, that has to be kept in mind. Yeah, and, and just to be clear for those uh, on the phone, uh, Greater Fairlands includes coastline, but also goes out uh, into the deep ocean. So um, here's another question or comment. Managers and MPA partners often struggle with the lack of downscale data for their sites or regions and lack of information for vulnerability assessments or adaptive potential in order to do robust scenario planning and develop adaptation strategies. Where do these management plans land on this level of planning? And do you have any thoughts on ways to overcome this? So um, thoughts and ways to overcome it. Probably a little bit outside of the scope. I could you know, probably throw my hat in the ring. Um, the, the reason that we centered on management plans though, to answer that part of the question, is because that actually gives uh, something that we can rely on or refer back to. And once incorporated into the management plan, the parks themselves uh, have a, um, a higher responsibility to then carry through and follow out on those actions. So that's why we concentrate on management plans because it's something concrete that the management teams and the parks uh, themselves, you know, once it's in their management plan and it's been approved and is, you know, published, then you know, not following through on those actions, again, falls into that um, area of, of uh, not litigation, but, you know, being able to be called to task being like, you're not, you know, executing on the management plan that, you know, the park was installed with and the funding was assigned for. And in the case of, you know, some of the national park services, there are, you know, some of the items are, are nationally mandated. Um, so, you know, that's why we concentrate on the management plans. That's why we think that actions that are inputted into the management plans have a higher possibility or, or chance of actually occurring 
and being you know maintained within the park so for us that's that's why we you know our first start was with the management plan and then you know seeing the results from the management plan and recognizing that okay you know there's probably more actions that are happening on the ground that just aren't captured and that's why we were like okay now the next step is to do the cold calls and actually reach out to the managers themselves and find out you know what hasn't been captured within the management plan i don't know if i answered all that am i missing something on that question no i i think you did um okay. thank you uh do you have any examples of MPAs that were established because of climate effects? Um, places that are um, climate refugia or um, are places where migrating species may be expected to uh, to find important in the future? Um, the, the subject of climate refugia was uh, a big component within the uh, research category that was broken down into modeling and assessment. Um, and the assessment portion of the uh, research category actions were the ones that dealt with a lot of being able to identify species that were at risk, um, sites that could, you know, serve as exactly that kind of refugia, and uh, track and see how the um, how the abiotic conditions not track, but I said evaluate how the abiotic conditions are impacting and will be impacting. Uh, some of their biodiversity targets. So within the research category and the specifically the assessment category, there was um, a lot of actions that centered around that. Now, in the management plans itself, in the ones that I went through, there was none of them that had specifically stated their initial reason or raison d'etre, you would say in French, their, their uh, reason for existing or, or their incorporation of the protected area was because of climate change and a protection of climate change. There are, I'm sure, examples of that that exist, um, but it wasn't within the management plans that I had. And, um, you know, we talked about the idea that, that the focus of MPAs should be on biodiversity conservation, that that's the purpose of an MPA. But we do have a question about um, whether you saw any adaptive management plans focused on carbon sequestration um, and the degree to which you're seeing that as an uh, as a mitigation measure in some of these plans and whether that was something you looked at. Um, so I, we didn't encounter it in the management plans, but we can also talk about the Greater Power Loans again. They have a blue carbon program that they've set into place, uh, which is dealing specifically with that. So um, for for the management plans that we are examining and looking through, a lot of the you know mitigative processes or actions that they would have that again were not you know necessarily related to biodiversity measures, so weren't captured within our database. Uh, but a lot of their actions weren't so much as the carbon sequestration, but limiting the amount of carbon they put out into the environment. But there are, and I mean, I'm sure a lot of people here on the call are aware of it. I mean, uh, blue carbon is, you know, an exploding field. And uh, I was put in contact with people at Greater Power Loans that have uh, initiated a blue carbon project, especially for that reason, to be able to uh, aid and increase in carbon sequestration. So for sure, a lot of the coastal MPAs, especially any ones that are dealing with eelgrass or mangroves, um, the recognition was not losing any more territory, at least they are able to, you know, maintain the current existing stockpile of sequestration that exists. And we have a question about whether you saw any management plans that regulate the disposal of dredge spoil uh, so that they can be used for beneficial use for habitat restoration um, and augmenting wetlands and seagrass areas. I have not. Now, it's possible that that action could have existed uh but then wouldn't have been found by our analysis if it didn't include any of our keywords right if it didn't have climate or climate change or mitigation or adaptation uh or resiliency um so again possible that that action might have exist but if they didn't have any of the keywords and weren't relating it back to climate change climate change measures or mitigation or adaptation 
it wouldn't have been triggered and pulled out within our analysis. So from what I went through, I did not uh, find that. But again, it's quite possible that they exist. It's just that they don't have any of the keywords attached to it, which would be surprising, but very feasible. Yeah, I will say, I think that's a good example of um, an action related to climate adaptation that may not be in a management plan because, it, for example, in the United States where we have funds for infrastructure um, that include habitat restoration money that, that um, you know, was not necessarily anticipated in a management plan but provides an opportunity, we're seeing national wildlife refuges doing habitat restoration by applying thin layer placement uh, for wetlands to, uh, to basically shore up areas that are being uh, affected by sea level rise. So I think there are some opportunities to bring some of those examples into your study. Um, yep. And I'd be happy, Vinny, to follow up with you offline about that. For sure, Lauren, I would love that. I would say that, you know, like a, a lot of these, a lot of the management plans, right, their actions, again, being mainly in monitoring and in research, um, a lot of them were running, you know, uh, uh, sea level, um, sea level modeling and whatnot. And the actions would stop at that level of like inquiry or finding out what is happening and what is wrong and, and not following through and then being like, okay, we've, you know, done a, you know, sea level assessment model and we're recognizing that, hey, we're going to be losing X amount of habitat that is necessary. You know, what is then the following subsequent management plan that needs to be implemented in to then deal with what we found out of the results of the research, which is what brings me to, you know, the, when they update their management plans, either on the five year, six year or 10 year uh, plans that they have, it's quite possible that, you know, after this round of research and monitoring, they've all have established a lot of their baselines and understand, okay, this is what we have, this is what's at risk. And then the subsequent management plans um, will will incorporate, you know, the management actions, be it administrative or adaptive actions that then respond to what they've identified in their research actions. So it's possible that, you know, this this you know this research or analysis that we're doing um, is very much at the at the start of things. So as the management plans get adapted. And hopefully they, you know, adopt that mindset of breaking out of these silos and being like, okay, you know, we have research actions and these are separate from our management actions. But, you know, hopefully the managers and the MPAs, as they continue to grow and evolve, are able to identify, hey, we've, you know, uh, identified this area of concern. And then what is the actions that we take from it? Which at the base is, you know, what adaptive ecosystem management is, right? So. Uh, the, the hope is, you know, as this database continues to grow and, you know, as management plans get updated and then we comb through the new updated management plans, that we'll see a growth in these, you know, operational measures uh, in response to what they've discovered within these last, you know, five years of their research and establishing baselines and monitoring. Yeah, great point. And I think that is the, the process that a lot of MPAs are following is doing uh, a climate vulnerability assessment and then from there doing adaptation planning. So will your database be able to identify which sites have um, completed vulnerability assessments as kind of a component of their research? You know, I hadn't thought about that. Um, it's easy though because uh, that would be easy for me to be able to incorporate in because uh, a lot of the vulnerability assessments um, were itemized as actions themselves. So they exist within the database and of course are linked to the um, the MPA in question, so uh, it would be an easy add-on for me to be able to track and see, you know, the who did the vulnerability assessments and then what uh, what actions then uh, came from that. Yeah, great. Um, another question. Lots of terrific questions here. Um, as we know, issues around equity and socioeconomic aspects. Um, are really important with respect to MPAs. And there's a question about whether you saw any management plans that are addressing potential conflicts with phishing or other user communities um, as resources move and uh, may move into or out of MPA borders. There was, um, in the outreach actions, 
um, for that we're dealing specifically with, you know, uh, transmitting the information of climate change or the risks of climate change or the the state of climate change within the park's boundaries to their partners or to the general public. Within that sphere of outreach, you would see um, references to multiple stakeholders. There wasn't as much uh, that I saw that was dealing with the uh, fishing industry. There was more to deal with a lot of the indigenous nations that are tribes that would have um, uh, be that their lands fall within, or, or I should say the MPA falls within uh, their lands, uh, as well as communities. So, especially in the 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 sites that did vulnerability assessments and were able to identify that there was habitat at risk of being lost, then the stakeholder engagement um, was very front and center in those management plans if if the, the surrounding areas were not areas that they could easily expand into. So there were some action items where it was, you know, just make contact with the surrounding communities um, and be able to inform them of the risks that are occurring, inform them of the changes that are occurring, and try to build those bridges to be able to see for the potential of buyouts of their land or of collaborations wherein it's still private property, but you know is adapting these you know measures and and um, uh, basically actions that the MPAs are suggesting. So there are definitely again these were a lot of the management plans um, out of the U.S. and some out of Australia that had these examples. But yeah, they what they were recognizing that they were limited. Um, by their ability to adapt because you know the lands around them or the area around them was out of their purview um, the push within the management plan was very you know concise of being like bridges and connections within these various st uh, stakeholders have to be made and not as in you know like they have to do something for us just you know do the olive branch outreach and you know start the dialogue now so uh, very interesting to see in, in some cases, um, any actions or plans or responses um, to effects of climate change, uh, in the case of some MPAs out of Australia, it had to go through approval of the uh, uh, Aboriginal and Indigenous nations there uh, before it can be uh, accepted and included within the uh, management for the park itself. Thank you. Well, we have come to the end of our time, um, but I just want to thank you, Vinny, so much for a really thoughtful and, and uh, thought-provoking conversation. And thanks to all the folks who sent us comments and questions. And I also want to thank Helene and Deb for their, uh, for their translation. Um, and uh, we'll look forward to continuing these dialogues next time we meet on another topic. Thanks. Thank you.